The Cloverfield Paradox is already on Netflix. It was originally called God Particle, and then it was announced it would be Cloverfield 3 after the first film in 10 Cloverfield Lane, and now all of a sudden it's on Netflix. They just announced it on Super Bowl Sunday. Everyone gets excited, this guy included. The first Cloverfield is one of my favorite monster movies, and I really liked the second as well. I like how this franchise is different. Each entry is unique, and it keeps it fresh. This film has been marketed as the one that will tie the previous two together and set up more possibilities for a Cloverfield universe that will change the way we look at franchises. And in some ways, this film absolutely does that. And in other ways, it uh, does some other things that we're going to talk about. Now, I have a lot of things I want to say. I've thought quite a bit about this. I was full-on bored Fox Mulder sitting at my desk playing with pencils trying to figure out how to approach this review and eventually I turned into Charlie Day from It's Sunny trying to connect all of the dots and make all the charts and eventually I just said to myself screw it just say what you want to say and try to be as analytical as possible without being too confusing and to do that I have to talk about spoilers. This movie's on Netflix. You can go watch it right now. More than likely, if you're a fan of the first two, you probably already have. This film takes place on a space station called Cloverfield. We have astronauts who are out in space trying to figure out how they can harness a new form of energy for the planet because energy is depleting and it's running out extremely fast. Our main character in the film has a very tragic past. Her children were killed when she accidentally left an energy cell on in the house and it caught fire. And her husband is back on Earth when an explosion happens. He rescues a young girl who was caught in some rubble. And he sees shadows of a giant monster running around. And when he's on the phone towards the end of the movie, he seems to suggest that there are monsters plural. Now, if you saw the first film, you know that there was a giant Cloverfield monster, as well as little tiny monsters that kind of sprouted off of that monster. So that could be what he's referring to. Or, this could entirely be a different dimension from the first film or the second. There are so many theories that you could make up to support this film or to knock it down. And that's one of my biggest issues with it. It's very unclear. I'm all for ambiguity. I like films that require introspection, that make you want to think about the movie, that make you want to analyze it, and that aren't easy to answer. The problem is, despite the fact that the Cloverfield Paradox is all of those things, it's also a very silly and trite film that has a lot of very unnecessary storytelling elements. Shoehorned in news footage with an author talking about his book and his fears of the possibilities of two different dimensions colliding, an ending that at first glance really does not make sense when you compare it to the ending of the first Cloverfield. The ship comes down out of space through the clouds and then the Cloverfield monster just bursts into view. This Cloverfield monster is even taller than the clouds, which could mean either A, this is an alternate universe or dimension, and this dimension's Cloverfield monsters are just that big. Or B, this is a fully developed Cloverfield monster, whereas the one from the 2008 Cloverfield was an infant, not even tall enough to reach above New York's biggest skyscrapers. So branching off that, there's a lot of things I want to talk about, and this is also going to spoil the first Cloverfield, and maybe we'll get into some spoilers for 10 Cloverfield Lane as well. So at the end of the first one, if you look really closely, this was a, a big thing in 2008. I was all over the forums uh, for this movie. You can see a little satellite or piece of debris, but it was sort of eventually revealed to be a satellite, fall out of the sky into an ocean in the background of their carnival footage. And that was supposed to be what awoke the Cloverfield monster. So at the end of Cloverfield Paradox, it's like they're showing that happen, except... The Cloverfield monster did not make landfall in 2008 Cloverfield until far after that event. He's also not taller than the fucking clouds. So that's something to think about. And in 10 Cloverfield Lane, at the end of that film, you realize that there's an alien invasion going on. There's already aliens on Earth, and there's a gigantic mothership at the end when she's driving towards the city. So for a lot of people, that was very confusing. The problem that I am having with these three Cloverfield movies is the timeline. It's all becoming muddled. It's difficult to understand what happens and when it happens and who it happens to. And since this film deals with different dimensions colliding, which is what happens in space, and there's a shift that occurs, you begin to wonder, well, okay, so if this film takes place in this dimension, 
Does the 2008 Cloverfield take place in an earlier or different one? Is this just another dimension that's now being created with another Cloverfield monster? What about 10 Cloverfield Lane? Is that another dimension? Do these all just take place in different times and, and different zones of universes and existence? So halfway through the movie, I thought to myself, ooh, this is really clever if they're saying that the Earth that Paradox starts on is a different Earth. And halfway through, when they get thrown to another dimension, I was thinking, oh shit, this is the 2008 Cloverfield dimension that they're going to go back to. I was like, oh, this is awesome. But then they would cut back to her husband on Earth in the original Earth they set up, and he has what seems to be a modern-day smartphone. Apparently, Cloverfield monster's there. This is why... <laughs> This is why I think I'm having so many problems with this film. As a simple space thriller, this film is filled with respectable performances, and it has some intense direction, some good production design, very nice special effects. As a space thriller, it works well enough. But as a film that tries to traverse and connect the Cloverfield universe, my brain is exploding and not in a good way. I like analyzing films. And this film has kind of, uh, <laughs> it's made it a little hard. And again, I gotta reiterate, you could really defend this movie because there are so many theories you could create as a defense for the things I'm saying. The problem is, is that they would just be theories. The movie doesn't really seem to have any concrete answers for what it's trying to set up. And the problem is, if you are a huge fan of the Cloverfield movies, like myself, and you've watched them and tried to connect them, this movie was supposed to bridge the gap. In fact, Netflix, on their Facebook, to market the trailer, they were like, 10 years ago, something happened, now find out why. This doesn't really make anything <laughs> any more clear. And not that it needed to be. The first Cloverfield was a great contained monster movie. Matt Reeves did a great job with that movie, and it was a lot of fun. The second film was also really good, and you could take the ending or leave it, but the film itself is a great contained thriller. This movie, in trying to bridge the gap between the two, just creates more questions than it really needed to, while also having a lot of really lazy storytelling aspects along the way, like unnecessary exposition, and jokes that sometimes worked, but also felt kind of forced. The things this movie does really well, beyond the aesthetics, beyond the performances, is it does have a breakneck pace of fun, adventurous thrills in space. And I have a soft spot for isolated films in space. But that breakneck pace is a result of feeling like everything has been crammed into a very short runtime when this film easily could have been two hours or more to try to tell a more cohesive story. So in the end, my favorite thing about this movie isn't necessarily the film itself, it's actually how it was marketed and the way we're now getting information like this and how surprising that was, which... You know, I would have liked to have enjoyed the film a lot more than the marketing. I'm going to give The Cloverfield Paradox a C. It's a respectably made film. If you don't really care about the Cloverfield movies, you can watch this as a simple space adventure and probably enjoy that aspect of it. But if you really want to think, it's just going to make it more muddled, which is kind of maddening because this film was supposed to help provide a little more answers and some more cohesion. But in the end, it's just created so many possibilities that it's tough to actually harness one and be like, that's what it is. Because now it's just anything, which may have been the goal, because now they could make a Cloverfield movie out of anything. They have so many possibilities and so many different universes and, div and dimensions that they could do anything now, which I guess might have been what they were trying to do. But that's disappointing for me, a longtime Cloverfield fan. Also, stay tuned. Later this month, I'll have my review for The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly published. I'm looking forward to doing that. Guys, you're the best. And as always, if you like this, you can click right here and get stuckmanized.